Good evening. Um, I'm, I wanted to get on here today. The Lord has really uh, put it up on my heart to uh, share some more testimonies, right? Because he needs to be given all the glory, honor, and praise that we can muster up in a day. And even though I haven't been feeling too good, um, and part of it is chastisement. So I'm just going to be transparent with you because there's something beautiful about transparency. There's some, something beautiful about being real with people about our struggles instead of pretending to be the perfect Christians that many of us pretend to be, right? We put on this face as if uh, we have no sin in our life and it's everybody else that just needs to get it together. However, we're supposed to go from glory to glory in this thing. And the only one perfect in this equation is God, is Jesus Christ. I just need to emphasize that today. He's the only one perfect in this equation. I know that we like to think that we have taken on uh, his, his righteousness yes as our own it's been imputed to us but it's not our own our righteousness is as filthy rag sometimes we actually have to be led by Christ you know he says uh, deny yourself pick up your cross and follow me but sometimes we have to be dragged a bit as a horse with a bit and bridle who's stubborn and rebellious um, and I know I'm preaching to somebody today hallelujah the Lord is speaking through me. It is not by might or by power, but by his spirit uh, that anyone can be edified, empowered, encouraged. Uh, hallelujah. So, yes, um, the past two days, I felt like something had pulled in my neck. I was in a lot of pain. My temples were throbbing. I'm like, what is this? And the Lord reminded me, I am a jealous God. I am a jealous God. Did you know that Jesus Christ is jealous for your affections? Do you know that when something else is causing you to be drawn away from him and enticed in any degree, and all of a sudden that thing is getting more attention than him, and that can even be the work that you do for God itself, that thing becomes an idol he said i am a jealous god and he hates idols he hates idols in our hearts my prayer for you today is if you have an idol in your heart and most of us do at some point in time an idol is anything that takes you away from your time that you could be spending with god and starts to take up more precedence in your life it could be a relationship maybe you're spending more time with your husband or your wife than you are with God. Maybe you're spending more time with your children. And he reminded me, I am a jealous God. I'm jealous for your affections. I miss you when you're not here. I don't want scraps of your attention. I don't want the end of your day. Yes, I love what you're doing for me. But remember that you can't do anything apart from me. And I have much to say to you, and I want us to commune together, and I want us to have that constant and continuous relationship no matter what you've got going on. So lately he has been um, reminding me that boundaries need to be established. You can't say yes to everyone. You can't just fill up the schedule and have four phone calls in a day, and the average call is, you know, four hours. You can't do that, Angela. You're only one person. So he was reminding me, yes, it's great. I'm, and and I'm, I'm thankful for what you're doing to bring my name glory and to testify of my goodness, my great, uh, my graciousness, my, my mercy, my unfailing love. But don't forget about me. Don't let anything command your attention more than me. So for me, it was, um, and it's funny how this works, right? We don't, know, we don't even know it's a temptation until we have the time to be tempted. So I was so busy, 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 right? And then time slowed down a little bit. And all of a sudden I got into this like idle, careless, you know, mentality where I just wanted to mindlessly scroll. You know, and I would tell myself, I'm, lo I'm looking for people to pray for and all of that. No, you can, you can lie to yourself. Our heart lies to ourselves all the time. 
all the time but all of a sudden 10 minutes turns into an hour that's an hour wasted that you could have spent in the presence of God in his presence is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore in his presence is where we derive our strength from he wants to pour into us because we can't pour out of empty vessels we can't be an image bearer of Christ without being filled up with his spirit hallelujah I pray that this is, is blessing somebody today. So I want to share with you a testimony with a sister. And just to give you an idea of um, her background. Her entire life has been pain and suffering. We have cried on many phone calls together. As she encounters the unmistakable, undeniable, overwhelming, overpowering love of God and questions every time, why is he doing this for me? Why does he care about me so much when all I've done my entire life is reject him and hurt him and, and spit in his face? So on this call, she was feeling a little bit down because the Lord had put it upon her heart to share the gospel and she shrunk back and the Bible says that the Lord does not take pleasure in those who shrink back but he also knows what is it in this individual that's causing them to shrink back what makes them timid what makes them shy what makes them want to retreat when they should be running forward hey I've got good news let me tell you something about Jesus Christ and what he did for you so she was feeling really upset about that like she had disappointed God as if God didn't know exactly what was going to happen see the Lord is not surprised when you let him down and I don't even want to say it like that because we don't our, our sin grieves God but we personally, we don't disappoint God. He is disappointed in our choices. He is disappointed in our actions. He is disappointed when we go astray. But he is not disappointed in us. What we do is no surprise to him. He's not sitting there going, oh, she did it again. Oh, what am I going to do with this one? He is not surprised. He, he's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He perceives a thought before we even think it. So he knows when you're going to fall, and you will fall, because my Bible says the righteous fall seven times, but they get back up. Does that condone sin? Does that mean you've got a free license to sin? No, it doesn't. But all have sinned and all have fallen short of his glorious standard, his holy standard. That's why you need Jesus, God incarnate, God in the flesh. God presented himself as a human sacrifice on the cross in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the invisible God made visible. He did that for you. He did that for me. He did that for people who hadn't even been born yet. Glory. And so she, as she was sitting there and she was feeling really down about herself, the Lord spoke and he said, I am not disappointed in her. And he said, it is no surprise to me it is no surprise to me that she's doing these things because he knew what was behind it. But he also knew that he was, about to, he was about to break the strongholds that had been established in her life that would cause her to do these things. What a gracious and a merciful God we serve. Amen. Yahweh at his finest merciful through and through his mercy is new every day if you woke up this morning and you have breath in your lungs it's because of God's mercy if you had some type of food on your plate it is because of God's mercy and God's grace if you have clothes on your back and shoes on your feet it is because of God's mercy if you are able-bodied and can work it is because of God's mercy and his grace hallelujah 
So he revealed that she had a stronghold of self-condemnation. Now, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if we were to sit there and listen to what's coming out of our mouths, we can almost hear the spirit behind it. We can hear the pride. We can hear the entitlements. We can hear the selfishness. We can hear the slander. People that are always talking about how dumb they are and what a fool they are and stuff like that. That's a spirit of slander th speaking through that person. And a lot of times it's just a projection of what they heard over and over and over again, like a tape tape recorder that never shuts up growing up in their household and not just in their household but maybe even at school from guidance counselors and teachers and coaches and employers it never stopped a lot of times that's generational so under the strong man of self-condemnation was a spirit of self-condemnation condemnation punishment torment captivity imprisonment slander criticism self-criticism self-degradation degradation self-pity now watch the contradiction here it's interesting we go from self-pity to pitilessness two very contradictory emotions remorselessness apathy bitterness, resentment, anger, pride, self-hatred, hatred, self-loathing, hatred, self self-destruction, self death. These are all demonic mindsets. This stronghold probably took her entire life, so we'll say about a little over three decades to establish. And Jesus Christ tore it down in a matter of maybe 15 minutes maybe 15 minutes so self-condemnation condemnation punishment torment captivity imprisonment slander criticism self-criticism those ones right there were attacking all aspects of her life all aspects of her life and when i say she had been brutalized and used in the worst possible ways i'm telling you the truth her own mother tried to kill her. Her own family tried to prostitute her. And then eventually she did end up in prostitution. And the person who led their, her there into that lifestyle was somebody that she trusted. Somebody, somebody that she trusted. Somebody that she opened up her heart to. After that, the next ones to go were self-degradation and degradation self-degradation and degradation were attacking her ideas beliefs image of self identity her heart her self-esteem self-worth self-confidence her thoughts and meditations of her heart her eyesight and vision how she sees herself right was also attacking her memories there was a lot of things in her childhood that she cannot recollect because of the level of abuse and because of demonic influence her awareness dreams she was being tormented in dreams all the time imaginations perception perspective self-dialogue mind reasoning and logic behavior actions conduct demeanor mannerisms body language responses replies reactions speech words dialogue mouth tongue teeth gums they were actually attacking her health throat vocal cords pitch and tone my lord after that the next ones to go and the Lord said self-pity was at the root of it all. Self-pity, pitilessness, remorselessness, 
We're in the following. Fingers, hands, wrists, palms. Sorry, this is just uh, self-pity. Identity, morals, reasoning and logic, memory, long and short-term memory. Awareness. It continues on. Heart. The thoughts and meditations of her heart. It was affecting her attitude, reasoning and logic, self-worth, self-respect, self-confidence, self-esteem, perception of self, perception of others, behavior, actions, conduct, demeanor, responses, reactions, and replies. See, when God gives us a breakdown like this, he's really trying to show us, us, how many of us know that the Bible is a mirror. Jesus is the word made flesh. Right? So a lot of times... He will show us what we cannot see, right? Because the heart is deceptive and it's wicked. Who can know it? Praise God. He knows it. He knows what's in there. The Lord, Jesus Christ, he'll tell you what's in your heart. The Holy Spirit will reveal it. All right. The next one. Pitilessness. Remorselessness. Apathy. Bitterness, resentment, anger, pride, self-hatred, hatred, self-loathing, self-destruction, and death. This was a long list. It was attacking her identity, morals, reasoning and logic, memories, long and short-term awareness, experiences, habits, tendencies, behavior, actions, conduct, demeanor. Mannerisms, body language, mentality, attitude, thoughts, ideas. Beliefs, motives, intentions, responses, replies, reactions, eyesight, and vision, mind, emotions, moods, and feelings, stomach, eating habits, digestion, digestive system. She was having all kinds of stomach issues, stomach lining, intestines, and problems with gluttony and overeating, spine, spleen, back, neck, shoulders, all kinds of bodily pain, shoulder blades. At just over 30, throat, words, mouth, speech, dialogue, communication, conversations, interactions, relationships, her family, her friendships, her attachments, her bonds, her ability to emotionally connect with people. The Lord then started to speak during this deliverance. He said, you will no longer put her emotions, moods, and feelings to death. You will no longer rob her of empathy or compassion. You will no longer numb her ability to show remorse or express pity. She will no longer be like the walking dead, unfeeling, cold, brutal, ruthless, detached. I break your curses right now. All of them. Curses. Curses can be spoken over us by other people in our life because life and death is in the power of the tongue. When you're unsaved and people are speaking these things over you, over you and people wonder why they start walking in that. It's because they're speaking curses over you and don't even know it. They're cursing your life. They're cursing your health. Jesus Christ can break that in a moment. The other kind of curses are ones that are actually intentional by witches and warlocks and people that have it out for your family and your bloodline. Or know there's some sort of calling on your life. Or maybe there's several people in your family that have callings on, on their life. So they start cursing people early because life and death is in the power of the tongue. She admitted, and these were her exact words, I do not know how I didn't become some type of serial killer. She said she used to fantasize about murdering people and about seeing them suffer for the things that they had done to her, especially the men that had used and abused her body in the worst ways possible, that she had pictured hurting them in the worst possible ways and derived satisfaction from seeing them suffer. I know this is speaking to somebody, whether you wanna admit it or not. I know sometimes we got a big wall of pride up and we don't wanna admit that we have such feelings, we have such thoughts. But a lot of us, if you put our thoughts the thoughts and meditations of our heart under a microscope and show them to everybody, it would bring shame immediately. 
But when we confess these things and we admit these things and we acknowledge these things and we bring them out of darkness and they come into God's marvelous light, that's when Satan loses his grip and not before. We have to actually admit there's an issue. So that was the first stronghold that broke. The next stronghold she had was a stronghold of self-accusation. Self-accusation was affecting all areas of her life, all aspects of her life. So it was a spirit of accusation, blame, slander, criticism, belittling, degradation, and insults. Even to this day, um, under the household that she's in right now, that's all she ever hears. And so she has to continuously guard her heart against it because pride which is something that needs to be broken in her and she acknowledges this all the time causes offense pride causes offense and if there are people around you all the time that are insult insulting you and criticizing you and you care about what they think that's an open door for bitterness resentment offense unforgiveness so we have to guard our heart for out of it flows the issues of life out of the abundance of our heart the mouth speaks whatever gets into our heart is eventually going to come pouring out of our mouths it's either going to be edifying empowering encouraging and uplifting or destructive poisonous venomous bitter The next ones to go after that were self-criticism, self-degradation, selfishness, and self-pity. Now, you'll see how some of these are repeated. So people think, you know, they get delivered of self-pity and that's it. No, you might have self-pity under five or six strongholds. The enemy was working overtime to keep this person imprisoned and in bondage and feeling sorry for herself and accusing herself and speaking nothing but words of condemnation over herself and you could hear it when she spoke so those were affecting they were affecting her reasoning and logic attitude mentality words speech mouth voice tongue throat vocal cords breath respiratory system breathing lungs hands, fingers, wrists, palms, arms, heart, mind, thoughts, emotions, moods, feelings, behavior, actions, conduct, heart, the thoughts and meditations of her heart, her entire bloodline, her family, her relationships and attachments. I'm going to tell you this. On a lot of these calls, when one of these demonic influences, these spirits manifest, they can feel it. They can feel it. They can feel it in their hands and fingers. Maybe something starts to hurt. Maybe something starts to cramp up. Maybe something, they can feel a tightening followed by a release. These things are very real, which is why somebody who maybe has a spirit of rage under a stronghold if they don't have the holy spirit and the holy spirit he is the great restrainer so you might be wondering well wow how could i have all these emotions i haven't had an episode of anger in six years the holy spirit is the only reason why there was one time in particular i'm standing outside of the hotel i was having a conversation with this man it was going good until it wasn't going good and all of a sudden he was screaming at me and i do remember one of the things he said is you're being combative and instead of arguing with him i realized at that moment the lord can speak through anyone to tell you something that's there and so when he walked away and he was done with the conversation and he didn't want to hear anything else that I had to say I came upstairs and the Lord said the word argumentativeness and he revealed to me that it was a stronghold now I could tell you I was surprised but I, I you know I was surprised because I hadn't really had a lot of arguments but when they did arise they became volatile and I didn't realize that there was 
there were spirits that were influencing me in that time to agitate that other person to open us both up to unforgiveness because some of them were actually people in the body believers people in the church right but a lot of times right before you get deliverance from these things that spirit that demonic influence will manifest long enough to let you know something's here something's wrong right the holy spirit makes it known lets it rise to the surface even though you don't explode and you don't say how you're feeling right because he's the great restrainer he reminded me i'm restraining you my love controls you but if you didn't have my spirit you would be acting exactly like this man right now so don't you don't you look down on him it was a reminder don't you do it you remember how you used to be and you would still be that if it wasn't for me that was a quite the conviction but it's the truth and the truth is what sets us free amen so the following were anger, bitterness, resentment, and offense. Those were in a block, and those were affecting her emotions, moods, feelings, behavior, actions, demeanor, mannerisms, conduct, heart, and soul. After that, the next ones were imprisonment, torment, captivity, bondage, slavery, enslavement, self-hatred hatred self-loathing self-destruction and death not only did she fantasize about other people's death a lot she fantasized about dying a lot she wanted to die she thought about killing herself many times that was a spirit of death manifesting the Lord then said these words come out of all aspects of her life and she was delivered from these and that stronghold was broken then he wanted to let her know what was causing her to shrink back right the lord doesn't want us to shrink back perfect love cast out every unhealthy fear there is a, a good fear and that's the fear of the lord the reverent holy fear that hates evil and realizes that he can cast body and soul into hell. So there's a certain respect and honor that we need to have for the Lord. And he's working on all of us. The minute that his Holy Spirit makes a home in us, abides and dwells in us, he starts to break down and crush our pride to the dust because our pride is in the way. And fear is another big one. Fear is a problem. If you're afraid of everyone and everything, you're not going to want to share the good news. You're not going to want to publicly speak. You're not going to want to tell people the gospel. You're going to be worried about how people are going to receive it. You're going to be wor worried about how they're going to respond and react and reply. And so you're going to hold your tongue. But when that fear, all the unhealthy fear that this life and sin brings, is cast out with the perfect love of God those things go away and we become bold and courageous because the Bible says for the righteous are as bold as a lion but the wicked flee when no one is pursuing them they're running and nobody's even coming after them that's not just fear that's borderline paranoia But there's no rest for the wicked and they can't sleep at night and part of the reason of that is because of all the fear the unhealthy fear that has made a home in their heart in their soul their mind their will their emotions etc so there was a stronghold of fear but these were the specific fears that were under it that she had to renounce Fear of man, fear of trusting, and to renounce something, it means I disallow it. I don't want you here. I'm coming out of agreement with you. Fear of vulnerability, fear of closeness, 
fear of attachment. And these will make perfect sense considering that she was a victim of molestation. She was a victim of rape. She was used and ab uh, abused, dragged into a life of prostitution. And so these days she was afraid of man. She was afraid of trusting people because the people that she had trusted had brought her into this. She was afraid of being vulnerable with people. She was afraid of closeness and attachment because it never signified anything good. She was afraid of rejection and abandonment. So she had to renounce these fears, fear of destruction, fear of condemnation. Always thinking that the Lord is just waiting to crack the whip on her and I keep emphasizing that we are saved by God's grace through faith and it is no works of our own however repentance is needed and though she did repent of her sin her sin salvation is to be maintained if you don't maintain a relationship what happens to a relationship that you don't maintain it falls apart it falls apart Okay, so there are actually people who have accepted the free gift of salvation, who did receive the Holy Spirit, and at some point quenched the Spirit so much because they just couldn't let go of the things of this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. They weren't seeking God like we're told to do cultivating that relationship with him there there is a relationship that is needed we need to abide in him that means to remain don't go anywhere you can't do anything apart from me jesus said you won't make it without me okay so that relationship needs to be maintained or what can happen what can happen Is that that person is given over to complete and total depravity and becomes apostate like rejected silver completely reprobate in the mind with zero remorse a seared conscience and at that point it is very hard for that individual to find their way back to God Hebrews 10 says it is almost nearly impossible for a person to be restored after trampling on grace because it's like we crucify Christ on the cross a second time after the tasting of his goodness and still choosing death over life that's what that is but God in his mercy and his grace is pulling people out of that very state right now and I'm meeting up with them and, and week after week, week after week, they're getting delivered and hope is coming back because he's that good. And if they seek and search for him in such a state, if they manage to seek and search for him and fight in such a state, he will send help. He will. Because he knows their heart and he knows whether or not they mean it. So she was uh, afraid of condemnation, right? But there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. So why would you fear condemnation? The ones who are condemned are those who have rejected Christ on the earth. They're already condemned. The ones who have accepted Jesus Christ as their, their Lord and personal Savior and haven't repented of their sin, they're already condemned. But those of us who are in Christ, we, we need to have no fear of condemnation or fear of punishment providing that we abide in him and her love for him increases by the day by the day every time I talk to her I can see how crushed she is when she disappoints Jesus out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks I listen to what's coming out of her mouth that tells me what's on her heart fear of failure fear of defeat Fear of not measuring up, fear of being forgotten, fear of public speaking, fear of betrayal, fear of abuse, 
fear of being lied to or manipulated, fear of being deceived. He broke this in a matter of minutes. Jesus Christ, the stronghold, probably started establishing from the time she came out of the womb for 30 plus years. And after the stronghold was broken, the Lord said, tell her to expect more courage. Because the Spirit of God is bold. The Spirit of God is not cowardly. The Spirit of God doesn't shrink back. The Spirit of God is not timid or shy. And so when the more of His Spirit takes over our vessels, right? The Bible says you must decrease, come low, humble yourself. Admit you're wretched. Admit you're a sinner. Admit you fall short of His glorious standard. Humble yourself every day. Man made up the dust. Acknowledge that the righteousness, the righteousness that you have isn't even your own. It was given to you. It was given to you. It was imputed to you. And you did nothing to earn it. We did nothing to earn it. We did nothing to deserve this. And look at what he is doing for this woman. Who came from a lifetime of depravity. Like many of us. Many of us. All of us. We're all depraved. We're all a mess without Jesus Christ. That's just the facts. That's just the facts. Left to our own. Left to our own. There is no level to the depths of how deep we would sink into darkness. Right? But then he comes in with his marvelous light. And yes, some people do go back. They go back like a dog to their vomit. They go back to Egypt. But eventually, you know, the father is the one who draws us. And sometimes they backslide for a while. But he knows who is going to accept him on the earth. And he knows who's going to deny him. Jesus Christ knows who's going to deny him. And he also knows the people whose hearts once they have been forgiven with the level of forgiveness that he is offering whose hearts are going to be devoted to him in every way possible and there's going to be nothing that they will not walk away from and nothing that they will not sacrifice and nothing that they will not give up to be in his presence for all of eternity to be reconciled back to him in every way to have his counsel, guidance, and instruction on a daily basis. To hear their Father in heaven say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Because he who is forgiven much, loves much.